we are um, in a, an extended conversation in which we're talking about uh, the way of Jesus. Remember that Jesus um, did not come fundamentally to uh, inaugurate or to launch a religion. He came to launch a revolution, to, to take the world back, if you will, to, to save the world. And he is inviting us as his disciples, as his followers, to learn his way and live in and follow him in that way. Uh, Jesus is convinced uh, that the world is one, one person at a time, not programmatically, but personally, relationally. And so he invites us into the practices, into the disciplines, into the, the, the training, the muscle memory training that will enable us to partner with him in saving the world. And so we're in that prolonged conversation and will be for some period of time. Uh, we're focusing in over these last, last, week, uh, last couple of weeks and then, then this week and next on this practice or this discipline of fasting which has been part of every um, known practice, every known uh, religion, really, for f four or 5,000 years. It's, it has it actually only kind of fallen off the radar of uh, evangelical Christianity in the last 100 years. Uh, and then when it started to see a resurgence in the middle of the last century, it got uh, kind of co-opted a little bit. Uh, and uh, so we want to talk about fasting uh, uh, next week as it pertains to prayer uh, and, and think through that. But this week, I want to continue the conversation uh, that Chris started uh, somewhat last week, talking about fasting as it applies to uh, spiritual warfare. Um, and particularly, the kind, there, there are multiple kinds of spiritual warfares. Uh, and there certainly, we, we want to have an awareness of the spiritual warfare that has uh, uh, extraordinary expressions, demonic, and, and so on and so forth. But I think it's critical to recognize that the most damaging spiritual warfare is not that kind. The most damaging, um, and, uh, and, and therefore the need for us to be most prepared, uh, spiritual warfare is the kind of the low-grade fever, the day-to-day, -day, the day-in and day-out. You'll notice when Paul talks about spiritual warfare, he doesn't talk about exorcisms as a way of responding it. He talks to us about putting on the breastplate of righteousness, having our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, carrying the shield of faith, the sword of the Spirit. In other words, the normal, everyday, day-in and day-out stuff that is necessary to hold the ground that you have been given that God has taken. And so I'm going to suggest that one of the ways that we are most effective in terms of spiritual warfare is utilizing the disciplines, the practices, the ways of fasting to train our body to help us, old, old language, but mortify, slay, kill, the flesh, that part of us that will take us down if it's left uncontrolled. Those normal desires that get tweaked into uh, insatiable demands that put the flesh, the, 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 the ego self, the false self in charge of uh, our happiness, our satisfaction, uh, whether whether uh, life is worth living or not, all of all of that uh, is really the kind of the the main battleground of spiritual warfare, um, and so I want to kind of address some of that this morning. We're going to start with the same passage that we were in briefly last week, and so I'm going to invite you back to Matthew chapter four. Jesus has been um, uh, uh, baptized in the Jordan River. He has heard the voice from the heavens, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Uh, the spirit has come and rested on him, dwelling on him uh, in, a, in a permanent fashion. And then it says in verse one of chapter four, Jesus was led up, that Greek word here is extremely strong. It has the idea of being driven by the Holy Spirit into the desert, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. 
And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, then command these stones to become bread. But Jesus answered and said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. There's a whole long dialogue that goes on next, but I want to just anchor on these two and we'll develop this and then move into another passage because this sets us in frame. Please notice that Jesus is after fasting, not weaker, but stronger. We misunderstand when we think that the enemy attacked Jesus when he was at his weakest point. In fact, Jesus has been spending 40 days and 40 nights not simply denying his body food, but feasting on the word and words of God. That's one of the natures, one of the aspects. Fasting creates space for us to feast on our true food, if you will, right? Uh, and so please notice the connection between the work of the spirit, the discipline of fasting, and the outcome. And it's that that we want to talk about. This, this language here of being driven by the spirit. Remember, the Holy Spirit will, will, will always seek to enable persons to become more effective in their following and in their discipling of Jesus, but the, or excuse me, they're being discipled by Jesus. But it's critical to remember that the main battle is not the, the esoteric, extraordinary things that require exorcism. The main battle is at the core of identity. The primary place that the enemy will attack you is at the place where you will forget who you are. And it is for that reason that fasting becomes a primary way, not just in dealing with the extraordinary events, but in the ordinary, everyday, run-of-the-mill stuff, because you need fasting as a primary way to help you discern what is actually going on here. So when this serpent comes, when this devil comes, when the Satan comes, in the parallel fashion as he did in Genesis chapter 3, remember? Jesus is not freaked out. He's not anxious. He knows exactly how to respond, not react, respond to the genuine spiritual warfare that is going on, partnering with the Holy Spirit, putting to death the deeds of the flesh, if you will, not succumbing to the temptation to turn stones into bread, because he is, after all, hungry, but he has developed the muscle memory in which hunger is not by itself a reason to eat. Did you hear what I said? Hunger is not by itself a reason to eat. This is strange for us because our bodies have built in clocks. And if you go past when it reasonably expects to be fed, it will remind you, will it not? You'll get a little hunger pangs about 11.30, 11 o'clock, depending on when you have trained it to expect food it begins to send up little signals, letting you know it's preparing for what's coming down. And, and you'll maybe even start to get appetites for certain kind of things. Peter would be nice. I'm thinking shawarma. I think I'm thinking actually that falafel or maybe you'll go, you know, Asian this this and, and your body. Well, am I am, right? Right. And, and what's happening, normal, completely appropriate, is your body starting to cooperate because it knows that under general circumstances we need food. Here's the, here's the problem. If every time our body signals a need, we respond by satisfying that need, we imprint our flesh with inappropriate satisfaction. And notice the language I'm using here, body and flesh. They're two different things. The body is the physical that God has given you. This is the horse God gave you to ride. Take good care of it, right? And, and remember, we are built from the dirt. Body is important to us. It is, it is not the container of our soul, but it is a component of our soul. 
taken from the dust of the earth into which God breathes the breath of life. We don't have, we, we have a body, but we are not body. We have a spirit, but we are not spirit. We are soul, combination of body and spirit. You with me? And if we're not careful, body will begin to assert itself and gravitationally pull us to the dirt. That's what happens when the body gives way to the flesh. Paul uses two different Greek words to talk about the difference between the body, which is entirely appropriate, that's desires are entirely appropriate, but which cannot be allowed to be put in charge lest it become the flesh, which drives us away from the spiritual life we were built for in the first place, and we get drawn into the ditch of our own lives. So that's the tension. Is, that, is any of this making sense? You with me? So, so in that, notice the role of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's primary role is to, is to empower us so that we never forget who we are. As a result, he takes us regularly to the crossfit of the Spirit, to the gym, to the desert, for as long as it takes so that even though we are under duress, we don't forget who we are. Even though the temperature is turned up, even though we are in the crucible of pain or, or distraction or suffering of some kind or another, disappointment, we don't forget, because those are the places, aren't they? When you forget who you are. If, 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 and, and, and so the Spirit will regularly take us to the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, which means as long as it takes, it's not a literal 40-day, 40 40-night 40 thing. It's a Hebraism that means there's a work to be done and the Spirit will have you in that place until that work is done. So he takes Jesus into the desert for as long as it takes to get prepared for the battle at the point of identity. And notice that the primary way Jesus prepares for that battle, that spiritual warfare, is by fasting. He wants to signal to his body that it is not in charge, that its appetites, while appreciated, valued, and necessary, are not the driver of behavior. Now, this is very challenging for us because we live in a, in a, in a, in a material world. We are made of the dirt, and we live in a world in which our appetites are the target of advertising, of all kinds of things that tell us that we must satisfy our desires. Whether it's sexual, or whether it's for food, or whether it's for relationships, right? And what ends up happening is that because we give in to this, this embodied existence, we become nothing more than body. This is why Jesus says you're gonna live in the tension between the material world, which he nicknames mammon, the physical world, and the spiritual world, which he calls the kingdom of God. He said you're gonna live in a tension of that, and if you try and negotiate both of them equally, you will end up in the ditch of your own life, because you will default to the dirt. So you need practices, you need things that will focus your attention on the kingdom of God and his righteousness. If you set that as your first priority, all of this other stuff, all of the necessary appetites will be used and helpful to actually be who you are and be uh, who you were created to be. But if you, if you try and live in both places at once, you will inevitably start to default and the, and the body will become the flesh, that ego spoiled brat self that drives decisions, that is unhappy if it doesn't get what it wants, that pouts like a three-year-old in Walmart when you say no, right? This would be an appropriate time to show all the YouTube videos of little children who were denied perfectly reasonable things for perfectly reasonable reasons and then have epic meltdowns of catastrophic proportions as if the world had dropped on their heads. That's the flesh. And there are 35, 45, 55, 65, 75-year-old versions 
of that? How do we, how do, how do we battle the flesh? Well, Jesus says, uh, matter of fact, I've thought about that. And actually, I'm pretty good at it. Learn my way. So he uses the body, which is a beautiful, ironic juxtaposition. He uses the body, denying its appetites appropriately, partnering with the spirit to put to death the deeds of the flesh. That's what he's doing. That's what fasting finally and ultimately is. It's critical that we recognize the appetites are not wrong. Hunger is not wrong. Uh, desire, uh, sexual desire is not wrong. The longing for social fellowship, not wrong. We need all of those things. The problem is, is when we get that horse pulling the cart, right? And, and, and that's when, that's, so, so it's critical that we recognize that even the temptation is not wrong. To see somebody to whom you are, even for a moment, sexually attracted, does not, that's not the problem. What you do with that, that's the problem. Right? And that's what we have to, because if you forget who you are, you'll think you're nothing more than your appetites and will pursue anything that glitters, only to discover not, most of what glitters is not gold. But you don't find that out right away. You find that out after you've crashed and burned a few times, and sometimes not even then. So Jesus says, look, trust me on this one. Order your life in such a way that you recognize the desires for what they are. They're not sin. Some of us shame ourselves because, uh, because of the temptation. We shame ourselves because of the desire. That's not the problem. That, by the way, is one of the primary strategies of the enemy. If he can get you to shame yourself because you feel natural things, you will sideline yourself and be useless in the kingdom. So we need to recognize Jesus was tempted in the same ways that we were, in the same ways that we are, and he didn't succumb to sin. Every temptation became for him a way of testing and training and development in capacity to deny the flesh so he could live the life of the Spirit. So that's what he wants us to do. And fasting becomes one of the primary ways to do this. Galatians chapter 5, Paul develops this even more thoroughly. He says, I say to you then, walk or live by the Spirit. You see what he's doing? This is Paul's version of saying, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Because when you do that, you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. The flesh, you see, sets its desire against the Spirit, the spirit against the flesh. For these things are in opposition to one another. And the outcome is you don't do the things that you, so, that you, so that you learn how not to do the things that you please. But if you're led by the spirit, you are not under that law. Here's what it looks like when you are under that law. The behaviors, the acts that the flesh produces are clear and obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that was an appropriate <laughs> email message. Bing. Either that or another angel got its wings. But anyway, um, <laughs> as I did before, that those who live like this See, Paul, well, let me, I'll come back. Those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Here's what the fruit of the Spirit is. When the Spirit's in charge, the outcome is love and joy and peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And that self-control, by the way, is primarily sexual self-control, but it refers to all manner of bodily self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Why? There's no need for a law when you already know what brings life and choose that consistently. Those who then belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. How do we do that? By saying no appropriately 
over a period of time until the body learns that it's not in charge. The flesh then learns that it's not in charge. So backing up here, Paul says, live by the Spirit. And you will not carry out, you will not fulfill the desire or the lust is really the word in behind that of the flesh. We are created in both of those ways, so there's going to be that, that necessary tension that enables us to be who we are. We've chosen to live, uh, and we are, are built to live in that thin space between the material world and the spiritual world because we're the image of God. We need to represent God to the material world and represent the material world before God. That's what it means for us to be his image. So that tension that persists between the, 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 the body and the spirit is not to be undermined, but it is to be negotiated appropriately. Otherwise, like we said, the body becomes flesh and takes us into the ditch. So um, that, that false self will hijack the normal and appropriate desires that are part of being a body or part of having a body, rather, and start to imprint identity, value, worth, significance, identity, all of those things on the soul, only when it gets what it wants. And the, when the flesh is denied, this is, by the way, one of the key ways that you can start to tell that you've begun to make progress. When somebody, including you, says no to the flesh, the anger response is minimalized. When anger is the primary response, you know that the flesh is still stronger than it needs to be. Because anger is what? It's a gift God gave us to signal boundary violations. It's not, anger is not bad. It's a good thing. But it's not intended to fuel response. It's the red light on the dashboard that tells you something's coming in. Something, somebody, something has crossed the line. Now, love and joy condition how we respond to that signal, anger can't be the driver to it. Do you see what I'm up to here? When the flesh is in charge, anger becomes the reactive, responsive, only way of pushing back when we're denied what we want. This, by the way, is part of what happens in a highly sexualized culture when just say no is not enough. I want what I want, you said no, now sex becomes not about sexual pleasure, but about anger and power. You see how this works? And, and please notice here, we have this idea, if we're not careful, that sins are kind of like speeding tickets, kind of like driving fast on the freeway. No harm, no foul. If I don't get caught, it's not that big a deal. And as long as we think of sins that way, we will continue to practice not saying no, thinking we're getting away with something. In fact, the, the reason sins are called sins is because they're deadly in all and any of their forms. Paul says, if you persist in practicing these things, whether you get a ticket or not, you don't inherit the kingdom life. You don't get it. If you persist in these things, thinking you're getting away with something, in fact, you're not. And that's the real spiritual warfare. If nobody knows, then I'm good to go. Oh, really? There is no such thing as a victimless sin. Because you're part of me. I'm part of you. When I screw up, our capacity together to be the image of God as a human community is compromised. When you aren't fully yourself, I am damaged in my capacity as part of the image of God to be fully myself. I need you to be on your game, buddy, because you're playing a position I can't play. And if you're playing wounded, if you're playing hurt, I want to come along. I want to support you. I want to get you back into condition so that the team can move the ball down. The, the, what's the, what's, what do we do to move the ball down? The field, the field. We move the ball down the field. This is why I stay out of sports. It's not a good thing for me. But anyway, you're tracking with me, though? So Paul says, look, uh, it, it, this, this, this fasting then starts to say to the body, again, appropriate desires, in this particular case, food, 
And you'll notice fasting is, 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 is typically is about food because food is one of the, the normal requirements. God builds us. He knows what we need, right? Um, it, it, so when we say no to these normal appetites, these normal desires that God has given us as a way of training, the Spirit partners with us to deal death to those desires, to, those, to that flesh. So, uh, and, and, and what you discover is food particularly is chosen because it's the fastest way to show out of how out of control we really are. And if I'm not happy because I didn't have my breakfast or my coffee, if I'm not kind and gentle and good without having had breakfast, I'm not kind, gentle, and good. I'm medicated. Got it? Because I want to become good for nothing. Not because there's reward, not because there's punishment. If I'm not, I want to just be good. I want to become so good and this, uh, that hanging on a cross... I could pray naturally for the forgiveness of those who put me there. That's where we're going. Got a week or two to work on that. <laughs> but let's be clear, that's where this is going. Jesus says, we're going to start with not hating people. Let's start there. But by the time you get off the bus, you don't even get to have enemies. Do you see? This is where it's... Why? Because you did say you wanted the kingdom to come in Long Beach as it is in heaven, yeah? This is how that happens. This is how that happens. Do you see what he's doing here? So as we push into these things, push back against the flesh and the power of the spirit, we have this, this, this partnership and we develop capacity. And fasting is just, especially for, for most of us, it's just, it's just, just hard work. Right now, what you discover is after two or three days of fasting, the body says, "Oh, there's a new sheriff in town." Okay, I, I can, I, 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 okay, we're fine. Because what happens? Most of the time, we signal our body signals that we're hungry. We're not actually hungry. We've gotten into a rhythm and a routine, and it's time to eat. The body doesn't necessarily need all the food that we put into it. I don't know if you've noticed this or not. In fact, some of us could live off the fat of the land for months. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but think about how this works. Because so, this is what we're pushing back against. All of these kinds of things, right? All of these kinds of things. The first thing that he lists in, in verse 19, sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. In English, it's hard to tell this, but underneath this is all of these words have a sexual uh, overtone to them. And they are gradually a circling of the drain into deeper and deeper levels of, uh, of brokenness. And I think it, it becomes critical that we recognize in a highly sexualized, highly pornographied culture that uh, this particularly is a, is, is a fundamental way of brokenness. And lest we think, let's, let's, can, can we just be clear on this? Getting married doesn't fix this. In fact, I would argue, given the fact that sexual issues are the number one or number two reason people say for divorce, that if you haven't learned sexual self-control before you're married, it's really challenging to learn it once you are. Right? You'll notice that one of the fruit of the Spirit is sexual self-control. There's all kinds of ways of sexual brokenness. We love to target one or two or three, or this group or that group or the other group, but let's be clear, all kinds of brokenness at the level of sexuality works its way out into the entirety of the community, right? But you'll notice, this is not for Paul the most damaging of the deeds of the flesh. Did you catch this? This is the top of the list. These are the red sins that everybody focuses on and everybody freaks out about. And Paul says, yeah, it's a big deal. It's not insignificant. But here's where it really gets messy. When you're worshiping stuff that you ought not worship. When you're flirting with the dark side of the culture in witchcraft. 
And even that's not the worst. You notice what he's doing here. He's circling the drain of our self-destruction and notice what's at the bottom layer. Hatred, discord, jealousy, rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy. The interpersonal relationships, the things that disable us from being together in community the ways that we talk about one another and damage one another and kneecap one another in various, various ways, right? So how do we push back against this? Well, Paul gives us some suggestions. For example, in fasting, remember it's not just food that we can fast. So he writes in Cor Corinthians that there may be an opportunity for married couples to choose to deliberately set aside normal sexual relationships for a mutually agreed upon period of time to focus the heart towards precisely this. Right? It's not normal, but there is a value for a period of time of setting aside normal sexual relations for the purpose of prayer. Don't do it forever, and don't do it in isolation of your partner. Both of you have to agree on this. The normal expectation sexually in a marriage is yes. That's a spiritual discipline. As much as no is a spiritual discipline. Boy, that took a sideways turn, didn't it? Every, you all all right? Okay, sorry. Didn't know it was going there, but now that we're there. Um, so so, so, so the, the goal here is that, that expectation. But please notice, lust has no place in a marriage. Because lust is the objectification, the depersonalizing of a person for your sexual satisfaction. And it does not matter whether that lust is protected by covenant. Lust can't be protected by covenant because it destroys covenant. Desire, entirely appropriate. Lust will kill you every time. So how do we train? Well, Paul says every once in a while, the two of you get together and you agree on what will be a helpful period of time to reorder priorities. It's okay. Don't do it forever. And don't one of you do it in the exclusion of the other. You can't, that's not fair. Right? But together, that's okay. So that's one way to push back against those first three. Social connection is normal. But it's not hard for it to degenerate into cynicism and anger and bitterness and so on and so forth. So he says, maybe, maybe fasting could be helpful. What kind of social fasting might be useful? Well, maybe you could give up all of your social media for Lent all of the ways that you indulge FOMO. Any other old people not know what I'm talking about? You're all good. <laughs> FOMO is fear of missing out, which is what social media preys on, P-R-E-Y-S. Everybody's having a much better life than you. Everybody. I mean, look at what they had for lunch yesterday. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> I just had peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> but you see what happened. So, so, so as a way of training the soul, right? As a way of saying, no, I don't want to become parasitic in my social relationships. I don't want to live vicariously through somebody else. I want to live my own life. So maybe you should stop the mechanisms of comparison for a season until you can handle them wisely and well, and some of us may never be able to handle them wisely and well, because it's going to be a besetting sin for us. Okay, you can, you can actually go to heaven without an Instagram account. I know. Hunger is normal, but notice how food has become an addictive substance in our culture. It's become a way of hiding. It's become a way of power. It's become a way of shame. It's become the, this whole idea of gluttony is not just about eating to excess. Gluttony is also eating with excessive pickiness. I can't be satisfied unless I have the right balsamic vinegar. I'm sorry. 
I'll just eat the greens. <laughs> Hospitality says, have a cup of coffee, even if it's Denny's coffee. I know. This is, this is to my shame. I've told you this, yeah? If, I, I'm, I'm a coffee glutton. I love coffee. I roast my own coffee. I love, I love, we'll just have a moment. Right? And a few years ago, I just realized I was limiting my hospitality and pastoral care to people who would have coffee in places that I wanted to have coffee. I know. I, it, uh, I know. And Jesus said to me, you are going to have coffee with people at Denny's for the next year. <laughs> I might die. Mm, no, actually not. But do you see? Do, do you see? Now, with, with fasting can work in a number of different ways, particularly for our culture that makes so much of body image. Fasting isn't about losing weight. It's not about weight control, but it is about saying to your body, you don't get to compare yourself to other bodies. Beauty is not measured by how much I look like somebody else. If you have to look like somebody else to be beautiful, it's not you that's beautiful. If you want to lose weight because you're beautiful, cool. But you won't become beautiful by losing weight. That's not how beauty works. Do, do you see? And fasting says, no, nah, we got things backwards here. Let's, let's reorient things. Let's put things back in place. The beauty of these disciplines is that it's not just about mortifying the flesh. It's about creating space for the spirit to produce already the life of the kingdom. Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness. All of those wonderful faithfulness, self-control. That's what makes for the kingdom. That's what it looks like when the prayer, your kingdom come, is answered at the personal level. Can you imagine a community formed by persons who have been formed to the likeness of Christ like this? That's what's in God's imagination as the answer to that prayer.